Hi everyone, Eric at Retro Handheld Guides, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro versus the Ambernic RG556. Now I've had the Retroid Pocket 4 for a couple of weeks now, and I've been doing a couple of extensive testings for that one on various systems. You can see my videos in uh, the playlist below. The Ambernic RG556 I just got a couple of days ago, but I've been playing with that one for a while, and I'm going to do a quick comparison on what I think of the two devices, how they stack up against each other, and which one might be right for you. So, let's dive right into the comparisons of the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro versus the Ambernic RG556. Let's talk about my first impressions. First up is the Ambernic RG556. Uh, so first impressions of this one, um, honestly it feels a bit cheap. Uh, the plastic is not textured, it's just a smooth texture which you can see quickly attracts fingerprints. Uh, personally I don't mind that, it's just that it makes the overall feeling of it a little bit cheap. Um, triggers, triggers feel a little bit stiff and they have a little bit of a short travel to them. Um, shoulder buttons, shoulder buttons are Average uh, buttons here feel about the same as what you get on any Ambernic device. Uh, this D-pad though, it does feel a bit squishy, and you'll notice the D-pad here is actually non-textured, it's completely glossy, uh, which is a diversion of what Ambernic usually does. Uh, so if we take a look at the Plus as an example, uh, you can see here that uh, the D-pad has a bit of a texture and it's got those little arrows in it. Uh, so that's a little bit different. Uh, the D-pad does feel a little bit different uh, for this device, which is unfortunate because I really like the D-pad on the Ambernic devices. Otherwise, um, the sticks feel a little bit short. It feels like I don't have to press it very far in order to actually get to the edge, um, which we'll have to see how that works out in gameplay. Uh, otherwise, I love the fact the, the stick is on top on the left. I generally play a lot of PlayStation and GameCube games uh, with the um, analog stick as the main control scheme, uh, and it just feels nice having it up there on the top. Uh, that's why I loved my RG405M. Um, in terms of the grips, uh, I like the grips. It's nice and ergonomic. You can see it fits into my hand uh, nice and comfortably, so if I were to hold this as I normally would, um, you can see it just holding it uh, normally and it feels nice and comfortable even if it looks a little bit funny. Um, one thing I did notice about the grips though is that the weight distribution on this one is a bit odd. It feels like everything is right in the middle and these actually feel a bit hollow so uh, again it sort of lends itself to the uh, cheap feel of the overall device. Um, but otherwise I love the big screen. Uh, it looks great, it has great colors uh, and it looks good when you're playing some games. Uh, so the next device we're going to look at is the um, is the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Uh, as you can see here, this one is a little bit uh, smaller than the other device. Uh, if we were actually to put them side by side and compare the two, you can see here that uh, the RG4556 um, is actually much bigger than the uh, Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Uh, it sticks out on the side, it's also a little bit taller. Uh, so this one is a little bit more compact. Uh, it feels more solid, uh, it feels heavier. Uh, the weight distribution is nice and even, so it almost feels like a, a cell phone, a nice weighted cell phone uh, inside your pocket. Um, I love the textured plastic. It does lend itself to the uh, more premium feel of this particular device. Uh, the buttons are nice in this uh, device as well. Um, so you can see here that uh, they're nice and clicky. Uh, the D-pad is nice and clicky, which I like. Uh, the shoulder buttons uh, feel nice. Um, the trigger buttons actually feel a little bit soft to me. Uh, ideally for me, I'd like the triggers to be somewhere between uh, really light and soft uh, of the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro and a little bit less than the, uh, than the Ambernic um, 556. Otherwise, um, I like the feel of the joysticks. These ones feel like they have a larger travel and I actually like the uh, concave joystick cap of the uh, Pocket 4 Pro. Uh, this one is smaller, obviously, than the other one, uh, which makes itself uh, feel a little bit more pocketable. Uh, it feels like I can travel with this one, whereas the other one I feel like I have to throw it into a bag uh, and uh, bring it around with me uh, because, it's, uh, because it's a larger device. 
Um, overall, I think between the two, I like the feel of the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro a little bit better. Uh, it just feels a little bit more premium. The controls feel a little bit nicer, but obviously I love the control scheme of the uh, 556. Um, what you can see here when I pull out the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, if I'm using the uh, joysticks, I naturally have to flare my hands way out to the side here in order to get any sort of comfortable grip, because if I'm like this, I'll easily cramp my fingers. Um, I did buy the uh, case, uh, so even when I slip it into the case here, um, you can see here I'm still flaring my hands out a little bit uh, in order to get a comfortable grip on this particular uh, joystick. Um, and in gameplay, we'll have to see how that uh, works out overall. Uh, so overall, I think in terms of uh, first impressions, in terms of feel, I'd have to say that the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro uh, has a slight edge there. So let's take a look at the software experience uh, for each of these devices, starting with the Ambernic 556. Uh, so the Ambernic RG556 is an Android-based device. Uh, ultimately, that means that you can customize quite a lot of this experience, uh, putting in your own backgrounds, uh, adding your own launchers um, as well. Um, so from um, aesthetic perspective, you can change quite a lot of this uh, to your own needs. Uh, what we have under the shade here is the ability to put in our uh, mode so we can change the uh, CPU uh, overclock to um, from auto to high. Uh, you can also adjust the automatic fan. Uh, we do have uh, ability to uh, change the button configuration, so they have an NS mode and they have an Xbox mode. Uh, if you long press on this, it allows for you to change the trigger configuration as well, so you can have them act as buttons or triggers or both, and then what kind of trigger that you want. There is a button mapper available as well. To use the button mapper, simply long press on that, and then it brings up a button mapper. You simply drag the controls that you want to the screen in the area that you want for your app. There are a number of predefined configurations, so if you wanted to use a configuration for Genshin Impact as, well, as an example, just use that and it loads it up into the spaces where Genshin would uh, expect those, uh, those touches. The system does come with a built-in mapper, or sorry, a built-in uh, emulation front end, so using the button over here on the left, you can uh, access this um, launcher. Uh, it has it pre-configured for the apps, uh, emulation apps that are already on the system. So you can use that if you want to dive into your various systems to access the um, apps that you want and the games that you want. Uh, one thing that I did note that was pretty annoying was that this button here on the left is not a home button. It actually accesses only the Ambernic launcher. So as I press that button, uh, you can access the Ambernic launcher using this normal mode. Uh, pressing this button actually just turns it on uh, as if uh, the system were to go into the uh, launcher. Um, I cannot reconfigure this button, or at least I can't figure it out. Your home button is a long press of the back button, so I can press back or I can long press that to go to my home launcher. If I do set a home launcher, this button will actually replace it. So I did find that kind of annoying. All right, so next up, we're gonna take a look at the software experience on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Uh, so again, this is an Android experience, which means that much of this can be customized for yourself, including the backgrounds and your launchers. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro does have an installation setup wizard that allows you to pick your own um, apps that it wants to install. Uh, so it allows you to install uh, things like Dolphin and Aetheris X2, as well as a lot of the uh, standard lower end configuration uh, systems. Uh, I did, chose not to install them. I found that they're actually out of date uh, with the exception of Dolphin for handheld, which is uh, hard to find on the internet. Uh, so if you wanted to use that instead of the official Dolphin, then uh, you can install it through the Retroid launcher. Uh, otherwise, for the most part, uh, the experience is gonna differ from the Ambernic through the shade so here we do still have the ability to set your uh, control styles from retro, which is the Nintendo layout, uh, to the ABXY, so that just changes your uh, ABXY for Xbox. Um, you do also have an L2-R2 mode, allowing you to set from both uh, to analog or digital, depending on how you want to set up your uh, triggers to act. We do have a performance toggle here that allows for three different performance settings. We have standard, performance, and high performance. I found that with the latest firmware update, the high performance is uh, much better. It seems to scale uh, depending on how intensive the uh, usage is going to be. So it's not going to always overclock and run down your battery if you have a lower end uh, emulator that doesn't need all of the juice that uh, the system can spit out. Uh, the fan is um, 
setting between smart and sport. Uh, sport just turns the fan on all the time. Uh, and with the latest firmware update, I actually found that the fan settings are much better as well. So previously, the smart setting used to turn on the fan to the highest performance. As soon as you put it in high performance, which means that the fan was running all the time, it was actually pretty loud. Um, now the smart uh, fan only turns on the um, fan when it actually needs to use uh, that to cool the device. Everything in here is also pretty much the same kind of standard uh, Android type things. Uh, so the system does come with its own launcher, uh, the Retroid launcher. Uh, so Retroid has configured their own launcher if you wanted to set up your various systems, launch games from here. Uh, I personally don't use it, I use my own uh, launchers um, that uh, I, I choose to use there. Um, we also have the ability for you to do uh, button mapping, so screen mapping. Uh, so to access that, you need to pull up a game, and then from there you have the key adapter on from the right-hand menu, and then you simply need to drag your controls into the areas that you need them, and then that'll map to your, your buttons with on-screen touches. Uh, so that's how you use the mapping, uh, the screen mapping for the uh, Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Otherwise, for the most part, these uh, systems are very similar in terms of their software experience. Uh, they have the similar settings, just accessed in slightly different ways. Uh, one thing that I did like about the Retroid that the Ambernic did not have is under here there's a dedicated settings menu uh, just for the Retroid settings so you can configure your power saving, uh, TV connection, your vibration uh, motors, and uh, all that stuff in here. You can also reset and re-enter the uh, initial setup wizard if you wanted to reinstall any of those apps that uh, you didn't do the first time. Uh, Otherwise, for the most part, I think uh, as an Android system, quite a lot of this is going to be configured for yourself. I'm sure most people will end up just installing their own launchers and their own apps uh, as they need to. Alright, so let's take a look at some uh, gameplay here on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Uh, we're going to start with God of War 2. Uh, you can see here I'm using God of War 2. I'm going to be using the same version of Nether SX2 uh, with the same BIOS for each. Uh, you can see here that I've set the graphics through some initial testing uh, to have this set with a um, 1.75 resolution as well as the Vulkan backend. I found that that was the limit of the 100% uh, speed for God of War 2. Uh, so let's take a look a little bit about uh, God of War 2 on the um, Retroid Pocket 4. Uh, so here if we load it up, you can see first of all uh, load it's running at 100% speed. Uh, as I go in and uh, kill some of these guys, no dips. Uh, seems to be running at a pretty stable speed. Uh, one thing you'll notice as I go through this, uh, the way that I'm holding this console, I don't have the grip on right now, but I have my hands way out to the side in order to feel comfortable on this uh, joystick. Uh, otherwise, as I play it, uh, nice and stable, 100% speed, no dips that I've noticed. Feels okay, I can play it okay. So this one is definitely playable uh, on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Uh, so next, what we want to do is take a look at the Ambernic 556. Uh, we'll take a look at that one, and as I go through, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be using the same version of the uh, Nether SX2 for both. Um, I'm going to start by showing you this one at 1.75x resolution, again with the Vulkan backend. And as we start with the same spots, we can see here that in God of War 2, already we are only running at 85%. Uh, we have dips down as low as 75%. Uh, so... That is definitely not playable at the same resolution, uh, which is expected. It does have lower power. So let's give this a uh, good try. I found that if I drop this resolution down to 1.25 uh, and try that again, I will just reload my initial settings here. And you can see now running at 100% speed. Um, there are some dips here, uh, not really noticeable to me as I go through this intro, um, but I do... Uh, notice one thing is that the ergonomics of this feels much better. Nice big bright screen um, to play on. I'm holding this in a comfortable fashion. Uh, otherwise, I'd say uh, PlayStation 2 uh, is playable initially, for God of War 2 at least, on this device. Um, and I don't 
uh, have any real um, issues if I play this on uh, 1.25 uh, resolution. So playable, but not at the same resolution as the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. The next game I want to show you is I think going to start highlighting some of the limitations of the Ambernic 556. So if we take uh, Burnout 2 or Burnout 3 Takedown as an example, uh, this is Burnout Takedown running at 1x resolution. So even at 1x resolution, you can see right off the top, uh, we're only running at about 75 to 80% uh, in this first section. Uh, it does get a little bit better sometimes uh, as we start to play the game a little bit more. Uh, there are sections that go up to 100%, um, but you know, with those dips down to like 70, 80%, I don't think that that's what I'd really consider playable. Uh, you can try and tweak this one. There are other uh, hacks that you can use to get rid of the effects and probably make this one play a little bit better. But I'm just using this as an example to highlight, I think, the limitations of the 556 when compared to the Retroid Pocket 4. So if we were to look over at the Retroid Pocket 4 as an example, and take a look at the same section. What we'll see here is I'm running uh, the Retroid Pocket 4, uh, same game, but this one is actually at the 1.75 X resolution that I've been running most of my other games at. And here you can see uh, perfect 100% resolution or 100% uh, speed, no dips, no um, no skips or anything. This is just uh, standard with a 1.75 X resolution, and uh, as you can see. Running great, full speed, no issues. Uh, so I think that, you know, when it comes to the Ambernick 556, there are definitely going to be some limitations. It's not a full PS2 uh, game or uh, console, as opposed to the Retro Pocket 4. Everything that I'm running just runs uh, really great. So I think when you're going to pick up this for the PS2, I'd say, you know, most of the games are probably going to run okay, but I'm a little bit disappointed that we don't have just a straight the Ambernick runs just as well uh, PS2 at lower resolutions because obviously with this example uh, that's not the case even when I try to do frame skipping uh, at a lower resolution it's still uh, not great. Next we're going to take a quick look at GameCube emulation on the uh, 556 versus the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro so as you can see here uh, Mario Kart Double Dash This is running at uh, OpenGL 1x resolution. Uh, so, so far, no real problems. I'd say definitely playable. Again, oh, I love the, uh, the grips on this one. It just makes it so much easier to hold. GameCube, basic GameCube anyway, uh, so far, not a problem. All right, and then obviously on the uh, Retroid Pocket 4, if we take a look at the same thing. This is uh, Retroid Pocket 4. So you can see I'm using the grips this time. Uh, makes it a little bit easier to hold as I'm playing these, uh, these games. But even with the grip, you can see I'm holding it a little bit further out. Not a great start, but obviously, uh, same game, same ROM, uh, and this one is running at uh, full speed as well, so not not a real uh, not a real issue there. So so far so good for uh, the two of them on uh, the GameCube emulation. All right, next up for GameCube, we're going to be testing uh, Need for Speed Most Wanted. Uh, this is one of my favorite games on the uh, on the Retroid Pocket 4. Uh, I just love the triggers. This one is OpenGL 1X, uh, and I am using uh, VBI Skip. Uh, so you can see in the top right-hand corner right now uh, that we have about, you know, between 35 and 50 frames per second as we go through this little section here. Uh, overall, I guess not too bad. Oh, there's a little bit of slowdown. So, I don't know, I'm playable, I guess. It is a racing game, so you don't really want too many slowdowns. Uh, that one really crawls. 20 frames. All right, maybe there's some more that we could do to uh, do this, but this is basically just the uh, standard settings uh, with OpenGL at 1x resolution. 
Uh, right now I'd say probably barely playable for crawling down to 17 frames per second. Uh, let's take a look at the same thing on the Retroid Pocket 4. So here we have the uh, Retroid Pocket 4. Oops, triggers. Here we go. This is at 2x resolution, uh, OpenGL. Uh, same game here, and you can see we start off uh, well at 2x resolution, uh, dipping down to about 37 frames per second. Overall, uh, pretty smooth. I've played a bunch of this so far on my Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I haven't had too many issues with this, so I guess that's again showing you the limitations of the cheaper and weaker chipset on the Ambernic 556. Uh, definitely, if you are going to pick one of these up for GameCube or PS2 emulation, I would temper my expectations. If you're looking for GameCube and PS2, Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is most definitely the way to go as you will be struggling with some of these games or requiring many tweaks to get the PS2 and the GameCube games running at a good uh, decent speed. Uh, so definitely capable of some, but not all. Alright, so next up I wanted to take a look at a little bit of Wii emulation uh, with Modern Warfare 3 uh, to see how Wii emulation does as well as also to uh, see how a joystick centric uh, control scheme works on the Retroid Pocket 4. So uh, let's take a look at uh, Modern Warfare 3. Again, you can see I have to flare my uh, hands out to the side to really get a good grip on it. It's okay, it's just awkward uh, holding it like that. Uh, both of these are running at uh, 1x resolution for uh, both of them uh, with OpenGL as well. Uh, so this one seems to be running uh, just fine. Uh, I haven't seen any dips or uh, any issues with the uh, way that it's running. I feel, I mean this one has the snap too. Uh, but I feel like the uh, aiming's not that bad here, it's just I gotta really hold it out to the side. It doesn't feel like I could hold this uh, in this configuration for uh, a longer play session. Or well, though this seems to be running, uh, running, running pretty good. So let's take a look now at the uh, Ambernic 556 for the same thing. Uh, you can see here obviously I got a nice good uh, grip on it and uh, let's take a look. Uh, first thing to notice is that it is definitely not running uh, full speed. Um, well, it's running full speed, but it has uh, the V skips on, so uh, we are going to be getting less than uh, the same number of frames. Uh, but this one feels a lot better to hold. I just feel like I got a good grip on it. Uh, so I'm playing it pretty well so far. Feels uh, better to handle. I'll probably hold this uh, in this configuration a lot longer. Yeah, so Nintendo Wii uh, emulation, pretty good. Uh, definitely this grip is a lot easier to hold, especially for uh, something like this. So overall I'd say, um, you know, the emulation on the Retroid Pocket 4 is obviously more powerful. Uh, this one can hold its own. Uh, this one is 1x resolution, again, the same as what I was using on the uh, Retroid Pocket 4. This one's just a little bit slower. Oh, there's some compilation uh, lag. Otherwise, um, yeah, not too bad. It can seem to hold its own for a Wii emulation as well. Let's wrap this up with some final thoughts on my initial impressions of the Ambernic RG556 versus the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. So I'm going to start with the Ambernic RG556. Uh, now things I like about this device, uh, I like that it's nice and big, nice big screen, uh, it has fantastic ergonomics, uh, it feels easy to hold for long play sessions. I like the joystick layout, this joystick layout is great in that I like the left joystick on the top. For the games that I play, this is definitely my preferred uh, layout style. Uh, makes it more comfortable to hold uh, when I'm going to do longer play sessions. Things that I don't like about the Ambernic RG556, 
Um, I don't really like the plastic that they used. Uh, it just feels a bit cheap. Um, the weight distribution feels a bit funny. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these um, grips feel a little bit hollow. Everything is kind of centered here in the middle. Um, otherwise, uh, my biggest gripe I think about the Ambernic RG556 is probably just the power. Uh, this device is only $15 less than the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, uh, and as this is supposed to be an upgrade to uh, the last Ambernic device, which are, I believe, the uh, RG405 uh, M and V, uh, this one doesn't feel like it uh, is going to be the next boost that I was really hoping for. What I really wanted was to be able to have a device that I could just pick up and play uh, with the GameCube and the PS2 games. And so far in my initial tests, that doesn't seem to be the case. I think that... Um, you still may be able to play most of the PS2 and GameCube games, but for pick up and play, I found that I had to tweak it, which is not really uh, what I was looking for. I was looking for a device where I could just put in my ROMs, play the games, and I'm good to go. But as of now, so far, it seems like uh, that's not the case. There are games that still struggle on this device. Uh, maybe with some tweaking, I can get it to run a little bit better. And I'm definitely going to be playing with those games over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so look out for my uh, emulation testing videos. I'll try to find the give you the best settings that I found for the different games that I'm playing. But otherwise, I think that if you're going to be picking up a device for pick up and play GameCube and PS2, the Ambernic RG556 is not that device. Uh, on the other hand, when we compare that to the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, uh, things that I like about it, um, I like the concave joysticks. Uh, the buttons feel nice to press. This is a smaller device, so that it is uh, going to be a little bit more pocketable, but as a smaller device, it also means smaller screen uh, and smaller uh, real estate. So the biggest drawback here is uh, the location of the joysticks. For the games that I play, this is really uncomfortable to play uh, for any period of time. Uh, with the grips, it does make it a little bit better. Uh, so if you're going to be picking this up, I would recommend the grip uh, if you're going to be using some games that tend to play with the dual, dual joysticks. Um, otherwise, I think that um, when we compare the two devices, this is definitely going to be my preferred device. I like the fact that you can just pick up this device, put in your PS2 or GameCube games, and start playing them without any tinkering whatsoever. Yeah, there were some games that didn't run. Uh, I think that that is probably just uh, a little bit due to the emulator, a little bit due to those kinds of uh, games that we're trying to play. But for the most part, I'd say very, most of them are going to run just fine. Plug in your ROMs, start playing games, and that's it. Uh, so I think for the fact that this is only $15 extra when compared to the Ambernic RG556, I would definitely say if you're looking for PS2 and GameCube uh, emulator, this is definitely my preferred uh, device. If, on the other hand, you're looking for just something with uh, good ergonomics, good big screen, uh, PS2 and GameCube are not the um, target games that you're going to be playing, then this one, you know, don't pass on it for the price point that it is. I think that I would still recommend the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, but if this one becomes a little bit cheaper, then I would say, yeah, maybe take a look at this one just for the screen, just for the uh, ergonomics of it. But at its current price uh, and power, I would say Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is definitely the device uh, for me. And uh, I would recommend this one to my friends over the Ambernic RG556. All right, so I plan on doing a lot more testing with the Ambernic 556, uh, PS2, some GameCube, some Wii. Uh, so keep an eye out for those videos uh, in the uh, coming days and weeks. I hope you enjoyed my video, and I will hope you have a great rest of your day.